Right, so the talk is titled GNU Linux com uh, Coming to a Phone Near You, My Molesta. And let's see. Some of the talk is going to be technical at the start for maybe five to ten minutes, and then it will be not so technical, more about showing what we did and what we have. Um, so if you're not very technical, just give it a couple minutes. Uh, so I'm going to explain what my molesta is and why we're doing it. I'm going to give you a brief history of, uh, of the project and how we, we got here in the first place. Um, I'll give an overview of the different components of the OS, which is the kind of technical part. Um, we'll give a current status update, show what it currently looks like, what works, what doesn't work, and some other news. Um, I'll lay down what we want to go, go for in the future, what milestones we still need to reach, and hopefully how you and everyone else can help and participate. I gave a talk about this project last year at OpenFest, and it was a pretty small talk about, you know, uh, we basically just started out and wanted to show what we were doing, and now we got a lot further. So there's a couple slides in the talk that will be the same as the one last year, but it's mostly different. Okay, so what is Memo Lester? Um, the talk I specifically wrote GNU slash Linux, um, which typically means Linux as in the kernel and GNU as in the operating system itself. So if you listen to Stalman talk about this, you'll keep repeating that, repeating that. And, you know, Android is also Linux, but it's not GNU slash Linux. It's Linux with a lot of other Java stuff on top. So when I say GNU slash Linux, I mean you take a GNU Linux distribution like Debian and you make it work on your phone. Um, and MemoLest is a mobile phone OS for phones and tablets. So smartphones, some tablets work, and it's based on Dev1, which is you might not be familiar with, but it's pretty much Debian but without systemd, so we replace some parts of Debian that we don't like. Um, we might just switch to Debian at some point, but currently we're using Dev1, and we're going to go to the current Debian stable soon. So Debian stretches, Debian old stable, and Debian buster is stable, so we really have to switch so we get newer software from Debian. But we mostly don't maintain anything. We just get whatever Debian does for us and add our packages on top of it. And one thing we really care about is everything that runs on your device that runs MemoLS that has to be mainline Linux. It has to come directly from upstream from the developers that work on Linux, not from a company that releases one version and then doesn't do anything with it for five years. So you see that most Android phones, they run Linux 3.4, 3.18, or 4.4, and they just never get a newer version at all because the company decides that they just kind of build a new phone and then they don't care about the old one anymore. And we also really care about the Linux experience, so that means you get to do whatever you want. Uh, you can hack around as much as you want. If you want the latest cool VPN in the, VPN in the kernel, wire guard, you can just install it. If you want to use better fast as a different file, uh, file system, you can just do that, and you know, it's up to you. And it's currently in the alpha stage. Last year we were in the pre-alpha stage, so we <laughs> moved to the alpha stage now. Um, so I've kind of covered this, but why? Why are we working on Namalesta? Um, there's a need for an operating, s uh, a mobile operating system for people who really care about free software. Uh, there's a couple that have, people have tried, and there's still a couple around. Um, Yola is a very prominent one, but it's actually not open source. It came from MIMO, and then Yola made a lot of things open source, but everything in UI is not open source, even though they promised they would open source it like whenever they started the company many years ago. They still haven't. Um, I'm personally very tired of Android, other OSs, and you know people promising they'd open source it, and they don't. Um, it's supposed to be open, hackable, and not locked down. And you know, we want to see that you can you can take a device, if it's older or a new phone, you can make it work on Linux mainline and just support it the way you're supposed to do it. Even Google can't do it, right? They have so many phones and still none of their phones have mainline Linux support. They just come with 4.4 or whatever kernel they decide they want to support for a while. And everything is done by the community, so there's no company backing or anything. It's just done in our spare time. Okay, so a bit of history. Um, Memo was originally made by Nokia, and they've been doing it for, gosh, um, a very long time. I think the, the phone I'm currently using is almost 10 years old. Maybe it's already 10 years old. And before that, so that was the Nokia 900, and before that they had Nokia N770, 800, 810, and they all ran different versions of MIMO. And the version that I'm still using is called MIMO Fremantle, which is MIMO 5, and it is also based on Linux and on Debian, so which is, it was a very good candidate to port to the new universe, so to say. And 
only some parts of Memo made by Nokia are open source, but it was pretty big at the time. So they sold millions of devices. A lot of people used it, and then Android and iOS came, and it kind of died off, unfortunately. But it's still branded as the, the hacker OS, the hacker phone. Like if you wanted to have a radio transmitter in your phone, you can just do it. You put your phone in your car, transmit over radio, and you can listen to whatever your phone is doing on the radio instead of what the radio is broadcasting to your car or that kind of cool stuff. If you wanted to route audio through your laptop to your phone over radio to the car, you can do that too. Um, it's still maintained kind of by the community, so there's still security updates sometimes, and they're still working on opening up more software. And there's some links about the uh, openness of, uh, of Memo for Mantle. So Fermental is the code name for Memo 5, and is the name of a wind, and Memo 4 and 3 were also called a, some kind of wind. So we picked Lesta, which is also a, a wind. So the idea is Memo Fermental was a successful operating system, even though it never, um, you know, Nokia stopped making phones for a long time. Uh, but it was, it was a proven OS. A lot of the APIs are, are just fine. They're working OK. Um, so we've, and there's a big set of applications that people built around Fermental 10 years ago, and some of them still work. There's still map applications, uh, you know, public transport applications, uh, applications to learn languages, that kind of stuff. It's still still there, and basically we just need to take that source code, recompile it, and it will work on Memo Lester. So the idea is we have Memo Fermental from Nokia. It was a very big project. that had a lot of people working on it. Let's take whatever is open and just port it, whatever is closed, rewrite it, and then keep the APIs the same so that we can leverage all the other applications that people wrote to just have, bring them to Memo Lester. All right. Um, this is a very long list of different components of Memo Lester. These are all the main core ones. And actually, uh, a big part of it is shared with uh, uh, Yola, Sailfish OS. So some of the parts that they open sourced are also here, and they kept working on some of these programs. Others they, they stopped using. So MC is the mode control entity. So if you have your phone and you, you, tilt it, you tilt it, it will detect that the accelerometer decides that your phone has changed. Or if you open the keyboard, it will unlock your phone. If you close the keyboard, it will lock the phone again. It will turn off the keyboard lights. It will make your light blink or not. Um, DSME is basically a, a, a program that runs or Memo services, a little bit like systemd. <laughs> so it will restart them when they crash, that kind of stuff. ICD2 is the connectivity daemon, so it's like Network Manager on Linux. It will manage your wireless connectivity, your USB network, your 2G, LTE, whatever connection, and it's written with power savings in mind, so it has features to only scan every 15 minutes or only every half an hour or only activate when an application actually wants to use the internet rather than always have it on. And if you have a phone, you don't want the radio to always be you know, active for data because then it will drain the battery very quickly. Uh, there's daemons to receive events from the kernel if you're plugging in cables or something else is happening. Um, clock D and alarm D are for the clock and alarm, obviously. Um, the Nokia has a very nice feature that I think we can make work on other phones, too, where basically you can, even when it's completely turned off, you can still wake up the phone using the RTC. So if you set an alarm at 7 AM, you can completely turn off your phone, and the real-time clock will wake the phone up at 7 AM. The phone will boot and down will wake you up when you're, when you're asleep. Um, Hilden Framework is the main UI frameworks for, for MIMO. So it contains different dialogues that work well on mobile. It contains patches of GTK and QT to make it look better on mobile, on mobile interfaces. So GTK and QT are the widget sets, the libraries that you use to build uh, user interfaces on Linux. Uh, Hilton Desktop and Hilton Home are the window manager and, and the main UI. So if, you, if you're using it, that's kind of the components you're dealing with. We have uh, uh, the same input method framework that Nokia had. So you can have all the kind of different keyboard layouts that you want. So it's super easy to switch from Bulgarian phonetic keyboard layout to English in like one button that just works really well. And PyMimo is uh, an interface to MIMO from Python. So pretty much everything that's available from C, uh, you can just do in Python. So it makes it a lot easier to write applications. And all of these tools existed already on Memo for Mantle, but most of them relied on old interfaces from the kernel that were OK 10 years ago, but now they don't exist anymore. Or they relied on other programs that were cool 10 years ago, but Red Hat abandoned them, and now they don't exist anymore. So a lot of this has been ported to what Linux now uses these days. 
So we use dbus. That's still the same communication. Gcon for settings. Um, UDEF for all the kernel events. So if there's anything happening, if there are drivers being loaded or if a cable is being plugged, we use that backend to figure out what's happening. Uh, all the input events have to be ported to the newer, newer interfaces. We still use Pulse Audio, and UPower and UDiscs are also uh, new interfaces for basically the same thing. What, what, is, <laughs> what is the uh, capacity of my battery? How many batteries do I have? Is it charging? Is it discharging? Is it the critical um, capacity? And then wireless is WPA supplicant. Ophono is what Intel and Nokia to, uh, built together for uh, open source uh, calls, text, and, and, and data. So if you're dealing with the modem, you always use Ophono, and they offer an interface that we then use in our, in our tools. Uh, LIRCD is for infrared, BlueZ, and Bluetooth is for Bluetooth connectivity. So all of this is, you know, it's, it, you can install in your Debian or your Ubuntu distribution. It will be there, and we just interface with the same things and hopefully build a nice UI around it that you can use on mobile phones. So really, um, a device running MLS is just a device running Debian. Um, so to support the older code, we had to replace old packages like HAL with UDAV, UPower, UDiscs, input devices, and we have to port a lot of the old widget sets and new widget sets. So GTK2, we had to port GTK3, G, uh, QT4, QT5, and there's GTK4 upcoming at some point. And there's a lot of drivers for phones with specific graphics drivers that are hard to, uh, to make work, and that's that took a lot of this time, uh, uh, a lot of time this year to make it all work with like the Nokia 100 and other devices. Um, and all our code is hosted on GitHub, and we automatically build everything that we that we commit. We automatically build it on our uh, infrastructure using Jenkins, and it automatically ends up in our Debian repository with packages. So if you're on Debian, you can actually just add a repository to your apt list and install whatever you want. It, Probably going to turn out very well if you're on a laptop, but you know you can do it. Um, okay, so we're currently in alpha stage, no longer pre-alpha. The thing that works, the things that work just fine, is a, a virtual keyboard. So a lot of phones no longer have a physical keyboard, so you need a virtual keyboard, and the Nokia 100 had that as well. But um, that works. Wireless works just fine. So. If you have a phone that runs Linux and Linux supports wireless, you can use our UIs and it should work fine. It actually supports more than some of the phones currently support when it comes to security on wireless. Um, connecting to the cellular network works if your modem is supported, if Linux supports the modem, and if a phone supports the modem, which is the case for most of them now. And it's still work in progress, so if you have a SIM card in there, it will allow you to unlock the SIM card. It will tell you what network you're connected to, 2G, 3G, LTE. Um, it will tell you what the operator name is. It will automatically figure out what the network name is supposed to be, and probably in one or two weeks, when you click a button, it will actually connect you to the data network. <laughs> um, audio usually just works fine. You can charge the device, no problem. Basic browsing works. Uh, browsing is a bit of a difficult point because um, very powerful modern browsers require a lot of resources, so we have a browser that uh, supports most of the things it needs to support, but not a lot more. Um, you can also just run Firefox on there. You can just install it from Debian, and you have Firefox on your phone, but it's not the most usable experience because it will look like on the desktop. And USB peripherals uh, on the go, host model just works. So usually when, when I boot my phone, when I'm developing, I just boot the phone, connect the USB cable, and I will automatically get a USB interface on my machine, and I can just log in over SSH to my device and do whatever development I want. Um, we also have a wiki page with the current status. Um, the things that we're currently really working on, and I think once that's done, we'll have a beta, beta release for several devices, is um, more of phono integration. So we can, on several devices, make calls from the command line, establish calls, actually reroute the audio. But you know, if there's no UI for it, then we can maybe make the phone vibrate. But if you don't have to type something while you're, I don't know, biking or in a car, it doesn't work. You can't pick up the phone. Um, and there's some other UIs to finish for, for, for cellular data. But it's, it's, it's getting pretty close. And then the next parts will be, OK, now we can actually make phone calls with a dialer. But if someone sends you a text, you want, you want it to render somewhere nicely and have the history in there. And Nokia had all of this, but unfortunately, they never made it open source. So this part is uh, something we have to either rebuild or 
reverse engineer somehow or find another library that kind of does the same thing that we can reuse. I think uh, Qt has some personal information management stuff that we might end up using. Um, 3D acceleration is so much better than last year. Uh, there's more devices that now work well, and actually, you know, if you don't have any 3D acceleration, the entire UI is so slow because it's rendered on the CPU and you basically can't use it. So it's a very frustrating experience. But it's gotten much better, mostly through the work of uh, uh, people in the community who don't just work on MLS, but on Linux in general or on another mobile system. And it's very promising, actually. And camera support is something we don't yet support, but I think once the drivers are there, I'm not very worried. It shouldn't be super hard. Okay. So I prepared some screenshots because last year it was a very boring technical talk, and I'm trying to now no longer go with the technical stuff and move to show you something that, you know, what it looks like and how, uh, how it actually works. Um, and if time permits, at the end of the talk, we can go to the speaker room and I have a couple devices I can show off and, you know, you can use it. So uh, this is kind of hard with this light. Okay. Um, <laughs> Okay, so this is the uh, uh, wireless UI. So if you go to the status bar, you can select wireless networks, and it will show you a list of all the different networks and the one you're connected to. So this is at the uh, office of the Internet Archive in, uh, in San Francisco. It's a little better. <laughs> um, so it shows you that it's connected. It's an open network. Uh, this is my T-Mobile SIM card in there, so it shows me that uh, I can use that to connect to the data network. And there's some other random APs that I don't know or don't, don't use or don't have the password to. Then another thing, this looks very similar, but it was actually a big milestone for me at the time uh, when um, working on porting the wireless framework to the new WPS applicant framework is that WPA uh, EAP works. So if you're at a university and they require you to have like this intermediate certificate and it has to, you know, um, check with one of their servers to verify your identity rather than just have a simple password. All of that stuff works. And there's actually a lot of devices where it doesn't work really well, and I was happy to, to see that this is just works. So I, when I go to my university, I can just connect to the network using my credentials. Um, this is a UI to manage all the different networks. So um, if I want to go to a specific network, I can just change the password or change the name or whatever. Um, and, you know, this shows you that you can search every five minutes, every ten minutes, connect automatically to Wi-Fi when it's there or not. Um, this is the drop-down menu from uh, the home application, so you can get the battery status overview. You can set the phone to be silent or not. Uh, it shows that currently the USB cable is connected and set to charging mode only instead of, you know, a network or a mass storage. It shows you it's connected to a wireless network. So I made this screenshot just before the talk. So I connected to the OpenFest network, and that was just painless. And this is the system menu, so you can turn it off or switch to general mode and the current task, that kind of stuff. Or airplane mode if you enter an airplane. This is the current desktop. So if you open your phone, this is usually what it looks like. So you have a home screen where you can have application launchers, much like modern phones, except that you can arrange it in any way you want. You can have widgets or calendar widgets on there. Thank you. That's much better. <laughs> um, and it's currently connected to the 3G network. The battery is kind of full. And it's on Wi-Fi with a signal strength of uh, 4 out of, I think, 7 or 8. And it's connected to the KPN network in the Netherlands at the time. This is a task overview. So this is a terminal open, and you can send notifications. So if someone sends you an SMS or a text, you want to see that. So usually what happens is you'll get a window that says something's happening, and the LED on the phone will start blinking, and it will start vibrating, and you know, like a normal device should. Uh, notifications are looking like this. If you are charging or discharging, or if there's something else going on, you'll just get a notification that will go away again. This is the log screen. And this is the uh, actual application menu. So if you hit the button on the left top corner over there, the six squares, then you get an application launcher. Um, and these are some, some things that are already working. Some things I just installed straight from Debian, and then you just start them, and they kind of work. Others are ported specifically from the old Nokia memo. So for example, uh, Dr. Knox NAS is a SNES emulator. So Dr. Knox NES is a SNES emulator, and you can play SNES games or maybe even Game Boy games. Ikiga is a voice over IP application that works on the desktop, but actually kind of works on, on Mamo Fermento as well. 
Um, GNOME Music Player is something you can use to control your music players. You might know VLC. There's a terminal and settings. Um, we definitely have some more work to do to add more applications to the entire thing. Um, this is the settings UI. So there's the display. You can change the brightness, change how long the display stays on, or if it should not go on at all on certain events. Text input allows you to change the keyboard layouts. Notification lights will allow you to program the RGB LEDs on the phone. So should, you can basically customize it, make your own light patterns if, you, if that's, that's your kind of thing. Um, internet connections is for data and Wi-Fi. I already showed that. Phone will allow you to configure your phone, change the pin, uh, set up call forwarding, stuff like that. That's still work in progress. On the latest build, it shows up. And you can kind of move around, but it doesn't do everything yet. Um, and there, there's going to be more, more settings applets in the future. Uh, this is obviously a terminal. It's a recent screenshot because there's also a clock there now. Um, this is me logging into my home server using RC and I'm apparently in the free Pascal channel. Uh, and this is where you can change the terminals. You can change the font, give it different colors, that kind of stuff. Uh, browsing works. So I think this is NetSurf. So this is just from the Debian repo. I, I loaded up our own page. Um, scroll bars are kind of iffy, but it kind of works. And note that this is not something we built. This is just a standard GTK application. So you just install it, and then our GTK theme will make it kind of usable and renderable. So if you would click on the URL bar, the virtual keyboard would just pop up, even though that application was never designed to do that. Um, but because we have GTK patches that basically for every text input field pop up a virtual keyboard, you can actually use it without a keyboard. And this is true for a lot of applications. Uh, so this is what the virtual keyboard looks like on uh, English setting. I should probably include some other layouts in the screenshots. <laughs> um, and you know, if, if you uh, have a phone with a, with a keyboard attached, then if you use the virtual keyboard, it will only give you special symbols that are not already on your physical keyboard, depending on whether you have your phone open or not. Um, so it's kind of clever about that. Uh, this is the emulator I mentioned before. There's still some work to do to make it work on ARM, but it works on the uh, virtual machines. And someone else ported other games, so the My Own Game from the Mame OS now works. You can play a game and finish it. Uh, Marbles, which is a puzzle game, kind of works. And of course, Doom, which is when the 3D ever started working. <laughs> I can demo that later after the talk as well. <laughs> Um, and just as the GNOME music player, so if you use the music player daemon at home, you can just connect over your Wi-Fi and change the music that's playing on your server. Um, this is just whatever came up when I started. It has a first start assistant. I can go through the dialogues, fill in this kind of stuff. And again, this is just in Debian. It's not something we made or changed the looks of. It's just whatever the GTK theme is. And this is kind of clunky. <laughs> And this is Akiga, so it's a soft phone application. I was actually installed it this morning, and I was surprised by how well it works, um, because it's built, built for desktop. But I can basically connect to my uh, voice over IP at home line, and I can call people, and it will ring and work. Um, so the modem calls don't fully work yet, but you can call over IP. <laughs> and you know, this is me picking up a call and blanking out my mobile phone number, because the presentation will go online. Um, some other big news for us is that we applied for funding. A couple months ago, we submitted a proposal to a Dutch organization called NLNet. It's very readable on the slides. And they're a foundation, and they regularly receive donations, and they spend that on open source uh, projects, on security-focused projects, privacy-focused projects. And I think they also funded the uh, original GPL uh, copyright license or copyleft license. So they've been exists for a long time. and. Two days ago, they told us that they actually accepted our request. So we're going to get some money from them. And <laughs> hopefully boost the development a bit, a bit more. Um, <laughs> we have to figure out how exactly we're going to spend that. We submitted some ideas to them, like, here's what we can do. We can do all these things. And then they'll pick some of them. And then if we do them, those things, they can give us some money. And hopefully, they can also sponsor uh, extra hardware, so more devices that we can give to people who are enthusiastic about them, then they can help us out. Um, OK, so there's a couple of devices that are currently being supported. I'm starting with I think, what I think is the most exciting one. Um, it's called the PinePhone. Uh, how many of you have heard of the PinePhone? 
OK, it's like one third or half. That's pretty cool. Um, so the, the Pine phone is made by a company called Pine64, and they've been making um, si a single board computers for quite a while. Um, if you're familiar with a company called Olimax, I think the CEO is actually here. They do very similar things. They build um, these small computers with HDMI and USB and Ethernet, and you can just use them as a small server at home or as your multimedia station. Pine64 did the same thing, but they decided to also make a phone. So they took the same computer that's on their single board computer, and they decided to plug it in the phone. And we're going to find out if it's a good idea or not, but they're really pushing very hard. So um, a couple in March or April, I think, they sent me a development kit. I have it with me in my bag. I can show it later. It's very big and bulky. But it was basically their prototype of a phone. And only last week, two weeks ago, they sent me the actual prototype of the phone. So they're going to production soon, except that I was I left the, the country where they shipped it to just a day before it actually arrived, so I don't have it here, but I'll <laughs> have it in a couple of weeks. Um, but the exciting thing is it's going to be super cheap. It'll be 100 to 150 dollars, I think. Don't pay me on that. They're, I'm sure they're going to announce an actual price, but as far as like open source phones go, that's really cheap. As a comparison, I think the Libra M5 phone is six or 800 dollars, and they're not really making them yet. So that's cool. And the other cool thing is that the, the computer that they use on the single board computers that Olimax also uses is actually really well supported in Linux. So for years, people have been making that work, which means that you actually don't have to do a whole lot of work when you have a phone using that computer. And it's, in this case, an all-winner with double L A64 uh, chip. And I think the current version that we have is Linux 5.3 plus some patches to make the display work, to make the modem come up, um, to make the accelerometer work, make the front camera work, those kind of things. And to be clear, this is not just me messing around with it because I've contributed some of it, but there's a lot of people in Europe, in the US, in Asia making this phone work and doing a lot of driver development. And they all got similar development kits. And it's been really fun working with them. Uh, the other cool thing is that the Pine phone is actually pretty good for privacy. So um, one of the features they have is to have a hardware switch or several switches you can turn on and off for the modem. So if you want to turn off the modem and you don't want the modem to ever be powered, you can just do that. Just, and then the modem is gone. The same is true for the microphones. If you want your modem on, but you don't want it to be listening at all times, you can do that too. And the same is true for Wi-Fi. Another really cool thing that they did is that the modem um, is on USB. So you know, just these kind of lines. And the big thing about that is that that's not true for most phones. For most phones, the modem is directly connected to the computer. And usually, the modem is actually directly connected to the computer to a way that it can read any memory page on your phone. So whatever is currently being displayed on your phone, whatever you're doing, the modem can just read it. And the modem is a black box that shouldn't be trusted from a privacy or security point of view. So by putting the modem on USB, there's no way to access the memory directly. So the modem has to go to a specific interface. And as far as we know, there's no easy way to get any data from your phone that way. There's a couple other devices that did this, but I think any phone that was mass produced, I think including the 100, doesn't, doesn't do this. Um, and the awesome part is that the 3D acceleration just kind of works. Um, it's been a long time coming, six or seven years ago, and FOSDEM, someone announced they're working on a driver, and they stopped working on it, and then someone else started working on it, and now a lot of people are working on it, and uh, it's working. So I have a video somewhere where we have our UI working with this open source driver. Um, and like I said, there's a lot of people working on it. It's super cheap. You can find uh, full specifications on pine64.org slash pinephone. And I think they're planning on shipping it somewhere in January or maybe February to everyone who wants to buy one. So this is what development kit looks like. It's kind of big and bulky with an expansion for the modem. But it works. And Pine64 is also planning to support other mobile operating systems. So there's a couple other ones out there. There's UB ports, which came from Ubuntu. Ubuntu did a phone for a while. Uh, it, didn't wor or it worked, but it wasn't feasible for them, so they stopped working on it, and some people picked up their work. And I think that's actually the most mature mobile phone OS you can find. And PostMarket OS is a, a, a mobile phone operating system that tries to make it work on all the different phones out there. So the idea is if you have a phone and it's no longer supported by Samsung or someone else, their thing will run on your phone. Um, but that means you'll be using an old kernel and some old software parts and non-free stuff. But you know, they've been really good at supporting devices. And hopefully, if we do our work right, you can get the Pine phone with my molester pre-installed as an, an option. Um, 
And they're actually also making a tablet. So I actually got the tablet before I got their phone prototype. I have the tablet with me. It's not running ROS yet because the phone was more interesting than the tablet. Um, but I can show it to you if you want after presentation again. Um, and I'm not sure when they're shipping them. Maybe you can already get them. But it's, again, the same hardware, the same computer in there. Um, OK. So I've mentioned this device a lot. This is the Nokia NN100. It was produced over 10 years ago. You can still find them secondhand, refurbished-ish, but they're not cheap. It's still like 100 euro. But they're, specification wise, they're not good. They're 250 megabytes of RAM. Most phones nowadays come with two or four gigabytes of RAM, maybe more. And it's a single core CPU with 600 megahertz. So the fact that you can take the most a modern Debian distribution, run it on there, have smooth 3D acceleration, and still kind of be able to do whatever you want is amazing to me. Um, and I think that also kind of speaks to how, how cool the phone is. Um, the current work that we have needs more power management work. So on this battery, I get like 8 or 16 hours of, on a good battery if the modem is not powered on all the time. If the modem is on, it's like a couple hours. Um, and that's fixable, right? Because um, the Nokia 5 operating system I still use as a daily driver, it lasts for a week if I don't use it a lot, which is you know, weird for the fact that that's just a small battery. Um, it runs a very uh, recent Linux kernel with uh, 3D driver patches, and it's actually super smooth. Wireless works, the battery works, touchscreen works, keyboard works, USB works, audio works, the modem works. Uh, we just need a UI for it. Um, this is the Motorola, Motorola Droid 4. I also mentioned this device last year, um, but there's been a lot of things that have been changing here. So this is a device that was only made in the US. Um, and it was sim locked to Verizon, which means if you're not on a Verizon contract, you can't use the device at all. It's just useless. It works, but you have no connectivity. And that's still true, except that if you take it outside of the US, it works. So in Europe, you can do whatever you want with it. And they're becoming super cheap. You can buy them for like $15 on eBay. And they're faster. They're, they have one gigabyte of RAM, two cores at one gigahertz. So it's like the N100, but better. They, there's still some 3D acceleration stuff to figure out, but we're actually making a lot of progress on that now in the last couple of weeks. So hopefully, within a month, the 3D acceleration will work just as well as on the N100, and it will be a usable device. Uh, without 3D acceleration, you get very frustrated very quickly. Um, and basically, everything, wor everything works. So even the modem phone calls work. I, I met up with a friend last week in San Francisco who's been working on this device for four or five years not by himself, with just a couple people, and they actually made it work really well. And he has, he's doing SMS using Perl scripts that converted to a mailbox format that he then reads in his email client. If he replies, it does something weird. So he has his own uh, tiny window manager-based operating system, but you know, it's, it's working, and uh, he gets battery life of a couple days, which I think is really impressive. Um, and if people are super excited and are sure that they have some time to help out, I have many devices with me. I'll, I'm bring, going to bring them tomorrow, and if, if you want one, I can maybe give you one. OK. Um, this is a, a random cheap tablet that I bought in a, a store in Sofia here. I think it was 80 lev. And with not that much work, we made the UI just run on it. So uh, again, it was all winner based, but slightly different version. And 3D acceleration works, wireless battery, touchscreen. It'll work. And again, this is work done by so many people to uh, uh, build all the drivers and make it work. Um, but it, it was surprisingly easy now to just pick up a random tablet and make it work. Um, if you have a Raspberry Pi 2 or higher, you can also run our MameOS OS. Uh, you just put it on the SD card and it will boot. Uh, 3D acceleration will work, Wi Fi will work, um, but it doesn't have a modem, so as far as the phone goes, it's not super interesting. But if you want to test out tablet things, it works. And actually, at home, I have a, um, a screen this size of Full HD with a touch screen. And it's a super nice way to, to, to test the UI and, and, and play with it. Um, all the develop development that I think everyone works on the US uh, does is in a virtual machine. So you, you, can, you can build software on the N100, and I've done it, but you end up waiting a long time. And using VirtualBox or VMware or QMU, you can just take our Intel image and run it in a virtual machine in like five to 10 minutes. And if you're a little experienced, you can take a USB Wi-Fi dongle or a USB modem and just pass it through. 
So on my machine, I actually have a modem integrated that automatically gets passed through the modem. So uh, I can just test it like it's a real phone, except that the microphone line is not wired up, but everything else works. So I can test most of my modem stuff here. Um, OK. So for the future, the main milestones that we still want to reach, my personal favorite one is dog fooding. So what I really want to do is to stop using this device and start using this device, which is the same hardware, but with Mamo less instead of Mamo Fermental on it. So I want this to be, become my primary phone. And you know, if I actually need to call people, it should just work. And if it doesn't work, I will try to fix it, and other people can try to fix it and, until it works. So that's, that's, that will be the big milestone. I am hoping that we can get more people involved to take packages that were previously made and port them to ROS, and we can package them. Um, very soon, I hope we, have, we can make an offer release for the Pine phone because if they're going to sell and they're going to sell pretty cheap, it might be a very good way to get people involved. If they can get it pre-installed with ROS, they might get super excited or not. Um, but they'll be able to swap it out. Um, and we're going to hopefully make better releases for the N100 Android as soon as we have some kind of usable UI for phone calls, which, again, is kind of the same as the first point. Um, there's still more work to be done to take the more modern widget sets, so QD5 and GTK3, they need more patches to look the same and work well. So some of this stuff I showed you was GTK2, and because we have our own uh, uh, extra widgets and styles for that, it just kind of renders OK, and you can take normal applications and run them. That's not true for GTK3 and QD5, which is what more, <laughs> more people start using now. So we have to work on, on making that work as well. Um, there's a lot of other stuff that we want to do, but nothing that that jumped to mind right now. Uh, in general, we hope we can involve more people and basically whatever you want to do with the device. Um, I was super surprised that I could just take it um, and then install a wire guard from a Debian repo. It would automatically start building the module on my phone. And when I probe, it actually just worked. Uh, that was super surprising to me. I mean, it's supposed to work, but still. And hopefully, in the very near future, we can have mainline Linux, so the latest kernel from Linus Torvalds himself without any patches on top, so it will just work, and you don't have to patch anything. Uh, full disk encryption is definitely something I want to work on, um, which is not something we currently have, but we need to just figure out what ends up being on the small image that not that's not encrypted that you use to decrypt everything else. And a better browser is definitely on the roadmap. And Getting Android emulation working will be super nice. Um, the reason I haven't done much of it is because the Nokia N100 is not powerful enough to <laughs> emulate Android, but maybe with the Pine phone, it will be way easier to test that kind of emulation. And there's a project called Nbox that does this. So they make an Android container and just run it in there, and it's supposedly it should just work. Um, yeah, so we're currently in the alpha stage. We'll go for the beta when we can make calls. Hopefully, we can move to the newer Debian version soon. And really, having just a phone with apps and being able to install whatever you want is super cool. Um, I've also done Wireshark on my phone, and you can just <laughs> kind of mess around with it. It's, it's fun. Um, there's some devices that work. They're not super expensive anymore. And we just need a lot more people to help out. Like I'm, I, I try, I'm trying to document and keep the wiki tidy. But there's, if you're also writing code and doing other things, it's very hard to keep that up. So I'm hoping that we can find more people to help out. Um, these are the resources. So here's our website, our wiki. All the source, or the source, all the source code is there. Uh, again, everything is open source, so there's no closed source code there. Uh, IRC, a mailing list, and there's also the memo.org community where you can go to the forum and interact with people who've used this device for a long time or might be new time users. Um, so this is about it. Um, I want to take a, say a special thanks to Ivalo because he's done so much work. Uh, he lives in Sofia, and he's been <laughs> helping out for many, many years. Um, if you're as excited as I am, I'm going to do a demo in the speaker's room after the talk. And uh, you can pick on one, of, one of these. I can show you my virtual machine with a modem. Uh, I can show you voice over IP calls that kind of work. I can see show you that you can send a text using a not very useful UI, but it works. So I can send a text from my laptop to my phone or to another phone, and that works. You can try that. Uh, I have a, a memo less than Nokia here, so you can mess with that if you want or break it, uh, at least the software, not the hardware. Um, there's some Droid 4s they have with me, but again, they don't have 3D acceleration, so I can show you that the UI comes up and it works, but it's not fast. Um, 
I have the, Pi the PinePhone development kit, not prototype with me, uh, but last week in a bar I put the battery in the wrong way, so plus and minus became minus and plus, and some smoke came out, so I can still show you the device, but I can't boot it up right now. I need to uh, replace one part. Uh, thank you very much. Hi, I Hi. have a ton of questions, but I just want to um, ask you one now. Um, how how this project uh, Memo Leste is compared to the Pure OS for uh, uh, Librem phones? Uh, do you think? I mean, it seems like you have a lot of work to do, and you are based uh, basing your work, your project on a previous project for phones mm -hmm. developed by a big company, and um, you ba you are based on Dev One. Maybe that's a decision because other developers of Dev1 are in the Netherlands, or maybe because of <laughs> System D uh, stuff. Um, and memo, uh, the original memo was based on uh, init as well. I don't know. If Upstart, that, yeah. Yeah, if that makes any sense. Um, but I'm just wondering uh, if you think that uh, Pure, based on Debian for uh, Librem phones, um, can achieve their goals. Uh, since you're doing a lot of work on this project based on um, Nokia's memo. Thanks. So there's a couple of questions there, I think. Um, the first one I want to quickly tackle is that um, we used Dev1, but it's probably only a couple of days of work to make it work with Debian. And with System D, we just never bothered because it's not worth it to us. Um, and your questions where I think twofold otherwise, there's do you think we can get something to work because they have so many people working on it? And the question is, do, you think, I, do I think that they can make it work? So do I think the pure OS can, can make it work? And um, you know, um, it's definitely a big project, and we've been working on it for a, a year and a half, maybe almost two years, and we're getting to a point where we can kind of use it. Um, I'm not sure if we'll have a million users in a couple of years from now, but if I can use it and a couple of my friends can use it, then maybe some people here can use it and happy with it. That will be good enough for me. I'm not trying to overtake the market. Um, on the other hand, I, I'm hoping that the pure OS people can get their device out and can make it work. Um, there's been recently some signs that it's not going very well. Um, there's some blog posts about how it, you know, they're out of money and the devices are way too warm and they're trying to think of adding a fan to their phone in your pocket. Which is like, um, <laughs> I, hope they, I hope they make it work because they have a lot of people. And if they can just make the software work, then we can take the Pine phone and run their software on it, right? Um, but there's a lot of stuff we still have to see. They're, they wrote that they did a lot, but I haven't seen that much of it yet. Um, and you know, our stuff is here, and we're trying to be humble about it and hope that we can get people to use it. Ultimately, if they succeed, um, I might be happy to switch over. But until then, there's no other you know, OS that allows you to just hack around with it and, and make it work um, for hackers. Hope that kind of answers your question. Uh, I, th I think, please be humble, but I think what you're doing is really cool. I like the idea of having Linux in my pocket on my phone. Um, I was wondering just how many people are you? This is, seems like a lot of work, and then you guys are putting in, uh, yeah, just what, what's the size um, of your team? So the people working on just the user space stuff, so nothing in the kernel, no drivers, is two or three people. Um, and the Vital did a, a lot of work. There's people in the past who did a lot of work, but they're no longer involved. So a lot of, actually a lot of people did reverse engineering or rebuilding stuff uh, uh, from scratch for Memo for Mantle because they want it to be more open source. And there's a lot of stuff out there that I haven't even covered, like media players and other things. There's uh, a lot more people who worked on that. I have no, no idea how many. It could be 10, 20, maybe even more. A couple people who read a lot of work. And when it comes to the driver development and kernel development, there's a lot of people. They don't just do it for us. They do it for themselves or other devices. But there's, I, I can't really give you a number. But at least the people that have touched some parts of the Nokia is, Kernel tree for Linux is at least 20, 25, maybe more, and a lot of them are still active in the, in, the, in the project. And for a moment, we had someone who was super involved for like a month and a half, or no, like for like four or five months, and he made 3D acceleration work super well, and then he left. Um, <laughs> he's still around, but you know, he kind of achieved his goal. He can use the phone for what he wants it to do, and, and that was it. Um, there's, I, there's certainly some friends of mine who were interested in some other people online. We have like. 80 people, I think, uh, 50 to 80 people in the RC channel and others on the mailing list. So there's definitely people following the progress, uh, but they, they don't all have time to help out. Thanks. Do 
I have a two-part question. The first one is, uh, are you aware of the Open Moco project that was more than 10 years ago? Yes. And is it possible to, to, to run it on that device? Because I, I uh, uh, plugged it in a couple months ago and it was still working. Um, I think you can do it. I think the specs are weaker than in Nokia 900. They're like half of the specs, so it might be a little tricky RAM-wise. Um, but the, the guys who did that project 10 years ago, they're still working on these devices. So they're still supporting them, so you can still take the most recent Linux and put it up. And if that works, a big part of it will just work. 3D acceleration might be tricky, but um, the same guy who started that project is still working on making that work well now. And it's actually helping us with the Droid 4 as well. So I think if you want to invest a couple of days of time, you might be able to do it. I don't have the device, so I, I can't do it for you. <laughs> I can actually give you the device uh, tomorrow if you, if you want to, to have I might sit on it for a couple months, but uh, yeah, we can, we can try that. Yeah. <laughs> the second part of the, uh, the question is, um, is there a, a room for uh, collaboration between your project and what uh, the guys from uh, uh, PureS uh, are, are doing? For example, this uh, library, uh, LibHandy, that uh, tries to make the uh, already existing UI uh, mobile friendly, like things like that. That's in part kind of what uh, Hilton also does. So the patches that we have on GTK and Qt, they do the same thing. So it's, it makes it smaller and more compact. Um, I hope that there's, I think there's room for collaboration. I'm not sure if we can use Lib Handy, but for example, I hope that once they want, when they have their phone dialer working and their context application working and text application, we can just use that. Like if they base it on GTK or Qt, I'd be happy to just see if we can, we can make that work. It will save us a lot of time. And we get something that kind of works pretty quickly. But so far, I think, um, they ha I think they've shown one video of uh, starting a call, but that's it. Um, I don't know. Yeah, um, so I'm not super familiar with all these projects, so this might be a dumb question for you, but uh, why do you use these old phones? I mean, can you just use a new Android phone and uh, flush it and put your OS on top? So w what would you flash to the Android phone? Yeah. Uh, I mean, why this would project? Yeah. Okay. So there's some ways that you can do it, but generally the Android phones are not super well supported. So you end up with a kernel, a Linux kernel from Samsung that they made five years ago. You can make your OS run on top of it, but you can't change it. It involves years of work to make it work with with a modern Linux. So the reason that I pick these devices is because I know that they work really well, and a lot of people tried hard to make it work. Uh, that said, there's several people who just took an Android device put our stuff on top of it and it worked. I think uh, one of the examples is the Gemini PDA, where they have a keyboard and an Android phone. Um, people make that work. Uh, we're just a little reluctant to support it officially because our goal is to have everything new and you can easily change it and modify it. And if you stick with an old kernel, it becomes a problem uh, also for security. Like if something breaks or people, uh, there's a vulnerability in Linux and it gets patched in Linux, you need to somehow figure out how you can make their code work with your four or five year old code. So it becomes as a maintenance, it's a, a real big maintenance problem. And if you have a lot of people who want to support their own device, I'd be happy. To, if people have a specific phone of Android and they want to support it, sure. We can make community images and, and as long as they maintain it, we can do that. Um, as far as why I still use this phone, um, I like the OS that runs on it. It gives me a lot of freedom to do things that I still can't really do on Android. And I don't really trust Android. <laughs> like the, the, the complete open source builds of Android, they're kind of good, but as soon as you want to do something useful with them that I can't do with this phone, like run WhatsApp or run Signal, then I have to pull in a lot of garbage again. And the, you know, I, uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. It was not a dumb question, by the way. Uh, I have one question. Uh, did you try running it on uh, FX Tech Pro 1? The new mm. one uh, with physical keyboard. Yeah, so I think they're making a new phone for Android with a, like a, the perfect keyboard, I think, what they, what they branded. Yeah. Um, I think they said they were going to, going to give us one device, but they haven't so far. So if they, or they can try to do it themselves, but so far they haven't given us a device. Okay. And they're quite expensive, so I'm not inclined to buy one just to see if I can make it work. So if you have more questions, you can find Marilyn in the speaker's room. And I have an announcement. 
Намерен е малък талон на автомобил Mitsubishi Space Star с регистрация RA4432 КВ на Георги Янакиев Георгиев. Ако е в залата, може да го намери в Lost and Found кутията отвън на рецепция. Да, свъзите. I'm just turning my monitor on. <laughs> Don't mind me. <laughs> Thank you.